is now our honor to introduce our second keynote speakers tonight. Christy Ma and Nikita Nukala. Christy and Nikita are recent graduates of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and are survivors of the Parkland shooting which took place at Marjorie Stoneman in February 2018. They cover the tragedy on behalf of Marjorie Stoneman's high school newspaper, The Eagle Eye. The pair also reported for the March of Our Lives event in Washington, D.C., and both will be attending the University of Florida this fall. We would like to thank The Guardian for helping bring Christy and Nikita here to you today. And in conversation with Christy and Nikita, please welcome Naila Budhu, startup host and executive producer for the radio show The 21st, produced by Illinois Public Media. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I wanted to start by saying, I know sometimes words seem inadequate in situations like this, but I wanted to just start by saying I'm so sorry for everything that you guys have gone through this past year. Um, and I really appreciate you being willing to share this and share your experience with all of us. I know we all do. So I just want to start by saying thanks. Thank you for having us. Yeah. And I thought we could start with that day and ask you all, both you were actually both meant to be in the same class. You were supposed to be in the same journalism class together and you got separated. And Nikita, you ended up downstairs and Christy, you were upstairs. Uh, Nikita, you, what prompted you to start tweeting what was going on when you were hiding in that closet? I think even when we were in the closet, um, all of us could see that it was just a very it was like a turning point in our lives as students at Douglas. We weren't going to be just students at Douglas anymore. So I tried to document as much as I could. Um, my friend Kevin, who's a photographer, he was trying to take pictures inside of our closet. Um, that way we had something to remember and to reflect on when we got back home. Um, and it was just a way of like coping with what was going on because we were in there for like two and a half hours. So we just really had nothing else to do. And Christy, you're you were with your journalism teacher. What did she say to you guys when you were um, in yeah, your class? Yeah, so right after we were separated, um, because Nikita was downstairs, and um, I was on my way downstairs, but the fire alarm went off, and uh, some teachers were yelling at us to go back to any classroom, whatever classroom is closest to you. So I quickly ran back up the stairs, back into Nikita's room, and uh, we just kept grabbing students out of the hallways, um, whether they were in our class or not. We locked the door and uh, we quickly turned off the lights and went into our supply closet, uh, which holds all of our photojournalism equipment. Um, we tried to fit 20 of us in there, um, which thankfully we were able to do. Uh, but our journalism teacher was in there as well. And uh, I remember she told us that um, this was something that was gonna change everything for at our school. And uh, we, this is gonna be our story and so we should document and be aware of what is going on around us, but also um, to not put ourselves in danger. So she told us to uh, take our phones out and hopefully we can take some pictures and videos of what's going on, but also if it puts us in harm's way to just drop it, um, it doesn't matter because it's your life at stake. And so Nikita, you had reporters who were DMing you while you were in the closet. What were they saying? to just know anything that was going on. And I couldn't really help them because I didn't know what was going on. Um, we were actually live streaming like our local news channel and they were showing like helicopter shots of the building where everything was happening and that's where we were getting the news. Um, so we didn't really know anything, which was very scary as both students that knew people in the building and also as like serious journalists. And so you all thankfully got home after a couple of hours and the vigil happened the next day. Why did you all decide that you, your journalism teacher gave you a choice whether or not you wanted to cover the vigil for the paper? Why did you guys decide you wanted to cover it? I knew that eventually someone would have to do it, and so I figured um, it would also be a good opportunity for me to write about it and be able to accept that this is reality, this 
is what's happening. And I think uh, writing it was another way of healing for me. Um, I was able to accept that this is my life now. And um, yeah, I was able to uh, just accept that um, we're on national headlines and that I've, we've lost some of our friends. And um, it was our story to tell. And so that's mainly why um, I stood up to do it. So I wanted to ask you all, I was thinking, as, and this is maybe not necessarily the vigil, but in the weeks after, Nikita, you particularly, because you had been tweeting so much, you were getting inundated with media requests and people messaging you. And I just thought, oh, well, they must have publicists or someone who's helping them. Was that the case? No, we, it was just me and my phone. <laughs> That's it. Um, and we had to basically handle, like, every reporter from every level. So there were, like, students going on and contacting us. And there were, like, local journalists and then national journalists. And we were like, who do we talk to? Um, and at that at that point, I just asked my teacher like for advice, and she was kind yeah, of your like journalism like, teacher. My journalism teacher, Melissa Falkowski, she was basically our rock in the like the last few months. Um, she taught us everything that we know about like handling the media and like just being tactful on air and off air and everything. So I wanted to talk about that. How sort of how you all handled the media and the kind of the other way around, how people interacted with you all. And I wanted to ask you, when you were getting requests from reporters, Nikita, did you feel, how did it make you feel? Did you feel like they cared about you? Did you feel like they just wanted a story? I know obviously you were getting a lot of different requests, but I just want to ask you about the tone of them. I think some of the reporters who asked me were looking for like a sensational story, um, which felt very insincere, especially like since we were such in such like a, a rough emotional place. Um, we were just like, we don't want to feed into your like tabloid news um, or like even like reputable like journalism uh, sources were selling stories and like we didn't want to be uh, giving people sources for their articles to get hit and click. Um, so that's why we took a larger role in our own journalism um, and tried to um, give like straight facts to the media and like when you were at the vi vi vigil that first it was it was like 24 hours afterwards what was the media coverage like did you feel like it was some people were insensitive um, there are definitely a ton of media crews out there uh, just waiting to pluck students out of the crowd just to interview them and I thought um, a lot of them were shoving cameras in our faces which was absolutely not the right time and place to be doing that because we were mourning the loss of our teachers and friends and um, I personally tried to avoid the media at that time because I wasn't emotionally ready to talk to them. It was a time for healing. I wasn't there uh, specifically as a journalist. I mean, I was aware of the whole environment, but um, I was just there to be with my friends. And um, I tried to avoid anyone holding a camera um, because I didn't like the questions that they were asking. They were very, uh, they were asking questions that were too soon, I believe. The timing wasn't really right. They were asking Titans. What kind of questions were they asking you? They would be asking questions like, where were you during the shooting? Did you hear gunshots? Um, did you know, did you know that, that Did you know anyone that died? Did you know the shooter himself? And it was just, it was just not the right time to be asking those questions. And were they, when people were asking you those kind of questions, were they basically just kind of like shouting them at you? Or were they trying to pull you aside? What was that interaction? Um, they were mostly like on the outskirts. They were trying to pull students who were kind of straggling behind. Um, so yeah, I just tried to stay away from the outside looking. And you also were doing coverage as well. I mean, you guys decided, you just co-wrote the story of the vigil. So you went to the vigil and then you wrote a story a couple of days later. And then your student publications also decided to do memor a memorial, a special memorial edition of everyone who had passed away. What was it like for you, Christy, when you were on the other end than when you were trying to interview particularly family members of some of your classmates, you were assigned to do a memorial of one of your classmates who had passed away. What was that, how did it feel when you were asking them questions? Yeah, so um, I took into consideration what was happening to me and what I didn't like. Um, and so I tried not to reciprocate that in my interviews. Um, I had to reach out to one of the victims 
was Nicholas Bora, and he was um, set to be a swimmer in, in out-of-state school, and he had his whole future planned for him. And so I knew like his parents were going through a very, very tough time. And so when I reached out to them, I just made sure that they knew that I understood that it was a very big request that I was asking of. Um, but I told them my purpose and what my uh, goal was, which was to honor him, hopefully, and um, to make sure that what I wrote about him was correct and that it would be something that they would tre that they would treasure. Um, and so when uh, I went to their house, they actually welcomed me with open arms and they even invited me to go sit in his bedroom and ask them questions about his life there. And it was very humbling. Um, we even broke down together. We hugged each other. Uh, we just talked about his life together and it was a very emotional The way Christy did that, the way that she approached the family, um, lots of people approached you in ways. Is there is there something reporters could say that would sound better? And do, could you tell that sometimes people, I mean, I don't know how many people started with, I'm really sorry for what happened, if you felt like they were just saying that just because they had to, because they were being polite. How did you feel like those interactions went? So I think those do come off like, oh, I'm just saying this because I feel that I have to say it. right. Um, and it does feel kind of like a form, but when I was doing my research for the memorial issue, I found myself starting in like the same kind of way. Um, even though I had a personal connection and that might have made it a little bit more easy for the families to read, it was it must have still felt like you're just like another journalist that asks a question. And I think that's a conversation that all journalists need to have in their newsroom, like how can we find a way to approach situations like this? Because they just come up so often. So I think I don't really have the answer, but um, it's something we need to think about. I think about just, Chrissy, do you think it's also just for you, I wonder with the example with the family, you were sharing your experience. Did you feel like you had reporters you met who shared a little bit of themselves too and then you felt like you trusted them more? Because eventually you did make a decision to start doing interviews. What was behind that? Right, so I only started doing interviews because, um, well, some reporters, I could tell, were very, um, very detached from the situation. Like they didn't, I could tell that they didn't really care. This wasn't um, something that hit them emotionally. But right, some you even had reporters who were coming up to you asking, like, "What city is this?" and exactly, stuff like that. Right. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, and so some reporters, though, I could tell um, they understood to an extent of um, the gravity of the situation. So they even gave the option of not responding they, they would say like I'm sorry that I have to bother you with this but and I know you don't you don't have to respond to this you don't have to reach back um, out to me but um, if you're interested uh, we could uh, talk about this a little bit more and we just want to know like what's been driving or like what's been going on these days and just want to get to know you and so those are the kinds of reporters who um, I could tell were respecting me and so I respected their request. On the other hand, I wonder if you guys could share what were probably your most negative experiences with the media. Uh, in the, in the, for the value of, I think, everyone here really learning from your perspective. Um, Nikita, I wonder if you could start. Um, so we actually did a panel kind of like this in the museum in Washington, D.C., right before the March for Our Lives, talking about student journalism. And in the pre-interview, we had specifically requested, like, please don't ask questions and like it was a little too soon for us and we didn't really want to give him any more attention um, and then when we went out it was a live audience on live TV and the one of the questions the interviewer asked was did you know the shooter and then everyone kind of just looked at each other and we were like uh, like uh, we don't want to answer that and it um, made everyone really uncomfortable and I think when people like request these kinds of things we should take them into consideration and did you feel like you could say, why are you asking that question? Um, well, since like we we're students and the interviewer was an adult, I felt kind of intimidated and I didn't want to like speak back to her. So that's why I didn't say anything and none of us did because we just didn't feel like that. Christy, what about you? Um, so for the March for Our Lives, I was stationed in the media tent. So I was next to a lot of big uh, news outlets such as like CNN, Washington Post, New York Times, 
Um, and it was very intimidating because they all had the right equipment. All I had was my phone and a friend who take pictures next to me. And um, it was, uh, well, one of the speakers, David Hogg, one of our classmates, um, I was asking him some questions. And all of a you sudden- You were interviewing him. I was interviewing him. Okay. And uh, all of a sudden, this lady from MSNBC, sorry, MSNBC, <laughs> um, this lady, she, she comes up to us, and I'm mid-sentence talking to David, and all of a sudden she grabs David's arm and goes, I need you for an interview right now. And I'm like, excuse me, I'm talking to him. Can I please finish? It, it'll only take a couple minutes. And she goes, no, I'm sorry, this needs to wait. And I was like, ooh, that is <laughs> rude. And <laughs> I, wanted, I was so mad, but I knew I had to contain like my composure. Yeah, you, <laughs> had to, you had to be better behaved than I know. adults, right? Yeah. Um, so that said, you also, you guys had some really, I think you also developed some really interesting relationships with reporters, and I wonder if you could share people who you felt like you really got to know and you learned from. Um, so there were these two reporters from, I think, the Washington Post, uh, Whitney Cheste and Alex Lee, and they basically covered our newsroom from almost the day we got back to school until the March for Our Lives. And really got to know them and they really like got to know us too and we felt like they really cared about the situation and they covered it when they published a story we knew like nothing would paint us in a bad light or they wouldn't take anything out of context and like make us look bad um so that was something that we really appreciated when they came in because you guys were really worried about that when you were doing interviews you were really worried about what to say because you were nervous that people would take what you said out of context Oh, Christy, what about you, in terms of good relationships you developed with reporters? Uh, so same thing with Nikita. I definitely felt um, a more a close relationship with Alice and Whitney. Um, they were uh, following us around uh, the newsroom, and they were very kind to us. And even when we were joking around and we would have mics on, we would um, say really obnoxious things, they'd be like, oh, don't worry. Like, we won't <laughs> put this in the, in the video clips. Um, and so we were really grateful for that, that we could um, have reporters that we could joke around trust, um, who we knew weren't uh, going to twist our words or, um, or harm us in any way. And you guys did a decision for your student publication, for the Eagle Eye, not to name the shooter. And I wondered if you could explain a little bit more of what the thinking was behind that. You did in the first story, and then you decided not to after that. Why was that, Nikita? So in the first story, it was the part of the news, and uh, at that point, we didn't really have a big editorial decision. So I was the one who put it in, and we published it, and it was just part of the story. But after that, when we got together and discussed it, we realized, like, the media has had such a big role in encouraging mass shooters in the past. Like, um, the Sandy Hook shooter and the Columbine shooter were known to, like, inspire Alex to shoot her. So we didn't want to give him any more notoriety than he already had. Um, so that swayed me the important decision not to name him in any more uh, of our publications. And later we found out like that was the right call because he had published YouTube videos the day of the shooting saying like that was his goal, like he wanted fame and glory for like doing this horrible thing. So that's when we knew like, oh, like we did the right thing. We don't, we don't want to name him. So what does, it, what does it feel like when you all see all of the coverage of even now with the trial or a different, not the trial yet, but as he's charged and those sorts of things, what is that like? What is that, and what does that look like when you guys see it? I think it's just very triggering for everyone who's watching the news, because I know like a lot of people have like local news on in the background and it's just like something just to keep in touch with our community, but then like you see like his face pop up and his story and then you have to relive everything again. Like you know that we knew that person like in passing and then he did this thing And I think it just sends, like, it doesn't have a positive effect. It only has a negative effect. And I don't think it's so newsworthy for us to cover every single aspect of their trial. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, like, when people search Stoneman Douglas, sometimes um, the, the first thing that they'll see is the shooter. And so we don't, that's why we, um, in the Eagle Eye, we decided not to uh, keep contributing to his notoriety. We wanted to instead focus on um, the activism or um, the student voices instead. 
what do you think this experience, what it's been, it's, all, it's more than six months at this point. Um, what do you think this experience, what have you all learned from this about news organizations or the way that news is built? Um, I think we've kind of learned that news moves really fast and a lot of things that you don't think will become news in a really big way. So just to throw an example, like uh, my friend Emma, she gave a speech at the Fort Lauderdale rally, and now almost everyone in the country knows her name. So that's like very crazy to me. Um, and it just shows like the impact the media has on public opinion and uh, everything that we've been doing has been covered pretty well by the media overall. And uh, it's just, we're really grateful for journalists who definitely is um, very powerful. People underestimate journalism um, because uh, we have a platform essentially to um, either highlight um, the shooter and his mindset and whatever his um, goals were, or we could focus on um, the better things, which are um, the activism that grew out of this and like the change that could hopefully be made in America. And um, It just opened my eyes to um, how journalism plays a role we should really keep a good fight and um, stay strong and uh, report what's truthful, but also be human in our interactions, especially. What have you all taken away from this experience personally, just with everything? For me, uh, on that day, um, we were hiding in the closet and we had no idea what was going on. And so um, I just remembered, um, I wasn't crying at that time, but a lot of my friends I was kind of in that survival mode. I didn't have time to be emotional. I was just like, I just have to get out of here. I just have to survive. Um, I have to be quiet. And so I was trying to calm down my friends because um, they were making um, crying sounds. And so I was like, Shh, you have to be quiet because this could endanger us. And um, once I got out, um, I just realized that I didn't even get to say I love you to my parents that day. And so um, I just was so grateful that I was able to go home that day and tell them that I loved them. Um, I think it's kind of like journalists have the privilege of walking away from something after it happens and they don't get to see all the trauma that goes on inside um, like we're all going off to university soon and I can't help but think like what if a shooter comes into my lecture hall on his birthday and like does the same thing um, so I think it's really important to keep fighting for that change and make sure that it can never happen to anyone you guys are going to school this fall. I think this whole room probably wants to know if you all are going to be journalists. <laughs> what, can you share your plans with everybody? Christy, do you want to start? Yeah, so I'm, we're actually going to the University of Florida next week, and um, I'm going to be studying uh, nursing, <laughs> actually, not journalism. <laughs> but you're still going to be working for the Gator, right? Yes. You're still uh, going to be reporting? For, um, for Sparks Magazine. Okay, for the magazine. Yeah. Okay. Actually, studying biology to be a doctor. <laughs> so, do either of you think you also have a future in journalism as well? Well, I've always had that dream of like, you know, when you're like 10 and you want to be like a million different things. I always want to be like a doctor and like a journalist and like do all these things. So, I hope that's my future. <laughs> Thank you guys, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for being so honest and hearing your story. Thank you.